I think it's really nice to bring these groups of rigidity people and circle packing people together. We have a lot to talk about. Um, so if this had been only a meeting of circle packing folks, I think I wouldn't have dared to give this talk because it's all fairly old stuff which they've heard before. Um, so apologies to those of you that have heard everything before. Um, we've heard about a variety of different kinds of packing. Um, I'm going to be talking about tangency packings and uh, unlike Phil's talk, I'm allowing branching. So he talked about univalent packings. I'm talking about multivalent packings. So that means that the chain of neighbors of a disk in the packing can wind around it more than once before it closes up. And later in the talk, I'll talk about some work with Jim Ash, who I think is here, and Ken Stevenson. It's about generalized branching and uh, you see how old this work is now. Um, so the main reason I agreed to give a talk is that there's one open problem in this area, which I think everybody should know about it. Um, Ken told me about it in 2005 in Finland, and I've been hooked on it ever since. So if you can use any of these ideas to solve it, uh, or solve it in a completely different way, then I would be very happy to see that. Okay, so let me start with something uh, of Ode Schramm's. So this is metric circle packings. So we're going to have, as usual, a, a triangulated complex, so a simplicial complex K. It's homeomorphic to a closed connected oriented differentiable surface S. Um, vertex set we'll call V, edge set E, face set F. And we're going to have a the structure of a Riemannian metric on it. So uh, it's a differentiable surface. That means at every point we have a, um, a quadratic form on the tangent space to that point, and that quadratic form varies smoothly as you move around the space. And in particular, it's, uh, it's non-degenerate. So uh, we're going to talk about the metric coming from that Riemannian metric, so the, the distance function. And in that metric, you can talk about closed balls. And we're going to call those disks, even though they may not be topological disks. Uh, so a circle packing, a metric circle packing of this complex K is going to have one disk, so one closed ball of the metric for every vertex V. And so that has a center CV and a radius RV. Uh, it's a packing, which means the interiors of the disks are disjoint. And then for every edge in the complex, the corresponding disks, disks have a unique common boundary point. OK, um, so the graph made of V and E is the nerve of the packing. And we're not going to require something that you might naturally think would be a good idea which is that the radius of each disk should be less than the injectivity radius. So that means you can have two geodesics starting at the center of a disk and they go off both being locally shortest paths all the way and then they'll meet again somewhere else. So this, and we're familiar with this happening in, in spherical geometry. Uh, in general, the distance that you have to travel for that to happen is called the injectivity radius and the, the minimum distance you, you have to travel for that collision to happen. And um, we're going to allow our disks to have radii bigger than the injectivity radius, which means that all kinds of strange things can happen. So they can have holes in, they don't have to have smooth boundary. Uh, the boundaries can have inward cusps. Um, and um, the topology can be really complicated. Um, but that didn't put Odo Tram off. Um, so he proved a very, he proved several very general packing theorems. Um, one of the theorems is about packable families. So he, he has a definition of what it means for a family of closed sets uh, to be 
packable, meaning that each vertex of your complex is uh, going to be assigned one element from its, its family. Um, so there are many examples of families which are packable um, and he proved that um, closed balls in a Riemannian, a smooth Riemannian metric on the two sphere uh, form a, a packable family. And the consequence of that is that uh, you have a unique packing theorem. So the idea is you pick, um, this is a, yet another normalization, not the one which Elias talked about yesterday. You pick three vertices around a face of your complex and you choose three closed balls, one to correspond to each one of those vertices, uh, which have positive radii and disjoint interiors and each pair of them meet in a unique common boundary point. So those, those three disks are good for representing the three vertices of one triangle. And then you have to choose an interstice. So that's a connected component of the complement of these three closed balls whose boundary meets all three of them. So we're familiar in, in ordinary spherical geometry that uh, any three closed balls have two interstices and we're going to pack the rest of the of the complex into the chosen interstice. Uh, and the theorem is that there's a unique way to do that. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, and the proof is inductive and topological, um, much like what Elias showed us yesterday. Um, a similar spirit to it. Um, the, the details are very different. Okay, so I want that to be in your minds uh, throughout the talk. That there's this very powerful theorem, uh, but it doesn't have it doesn't come with an algorithm. Okay, so a very special case is where uh, we have the spherical metric, and then we just recover Kirby's circle packing theorem from 1936. Um, I didn't say anything about the orientation. Um, the orientation is selected for you by the, the choice of those three initial um, packed sets and which interstice you use. Um, I recently discovered that the, the person after whom this theorem is named that any planar graph can be drawn in the plane with straight edges uh, is actually a was a Hungarian called Isvan Fari. Um, I had thought it was Fari's theorem, but uh, as with many theorems, it wasn't actually proved first by him. Uh, so a nice fact is that you can actually draw the planar graph and its planar dual simultaneously with straight edges at the same time, um, and that's also something that's much generalized by SRAM. Okay, so let's talk about circle packing in the hyperbolic plane. So now we're not uh, in the setting of SRAM's metric packing theorem um, because we don't have a, a spherical, we don't have a metric on the two sphere to begin with. Um, so now I'm talking about Thurston um, Thurston's take on Curvis theorem was that actually it told you about hyperbolic three manifolds. Uh, so he was interested in the question of when is there a um, polyhedron in hyperbolic three space which has specified combinatorics and specified dihedral angles. And if you extend each of those bounding planes of the polyhedron to the ideal boundary of hyperbolic three space in the ball model, then the way they meet the boundary is in circles and the dihedral angles become overlap angles of the corresponding circles. And so Thurston and Andreev, I, maybe I have the history wrong here. I think they independently proved uh, an existence and uniqueness theorem for these patterns. Um, someone can correct me later if that's not quite right. Um, 
So there's, a, there's an abstraction that's possible if you have a cycle of edges uh, where the sum of the overlap angles is, is too big, um, then it must be uh, just a triangle of the, of the complex. Um, oh yeah, so before I go on to the next slide, he, so there was a, an existence and uniqueness theorem for these, um, for these circle patterns. And uh, there's actually a paper, a more recent paper, uh, fixing up Andreev's proof of it. So it's got a complicated history. Um, now Thurston also said you can compute these. So that made it interesting for him. Uh, but the computational algorithm that he gave was not part of his, of his proof. Um, and it was only later that it was proven um, that his algorithm does actually converge. And that was done in several ways. Um, I'm going to tell you about a way, a way of uh, explaining Thurston's algorithm, a particular way of, of doing it, which um, mimics the idea of using uh, families of either subharmonic or superharmonic functions to construct harmonic functions. So that's the Perron method. Um, and so that was done by Ken and Phil. And I'm going to tell you about Phil's version, which is the upper Perron method. And it's actually what's in the paper that he showed uh, of his near the end of his talk. Um, OK, so we're starting with a triangulation of the two sphere. And we're going to pick arbitrarily one vertex of that triangulation. It's got to be represented by a disk. By a Mobius transformation, we can move that disk to be the unit circle or precisely the complement of the of the open unit disk. So on the Riemann sphere, it's everything of modulus bigger than one and the point at infinity. So everything else has to be packed inside the unit disk. Uh, and if you think about the group of Mobius transformations which act on the unit disk, um, that's going to act on the set of all possible packings and it also happens to preserve the hyperbolic metric. And so it's quite natural to think of working with the hyperbolic metric and think of the disks that you're trying to pack inside the open unit disk as being either metric balls of the hyperbolic radius with of the hyperbolic metric with finite radius. So those are the ones which are strictly inside the unit disk or they're what are called horror disks. So horror disks are um, what you get in the hyperbolic plane uh, from a disk which is internally tangent to the unit circle. Um, and those are, those are limits of sequences of hyperbolic balls whose radius tends to infinity and whose center goes off to infinity at the same time. So we can just think of those as infinite radius disks. Um, and again, that's outside of the scope of Schramm's metric packing theorem. Okay, so Thurston's nice observation was that you can compute the hyperbolic radii of the disks without saying anything about where the centers are located. So how do we do that? Um, so it turns out you can do it by fixing things up locally, one vertex at a time. Um, so let's think about just three mutually tangent disks. They're representing the three vertices of a face of our triangulation. Um, so if I tell you the radii of those disks in the hyperbolic metric, then there's a unique, up to isometry, a unique representation of those um, radii as mutually tangent hyperbolic disks. And so that forms a geodesic triangle between their centers. And you can look at the angle subtended in that triangle at each of the vertices. So let's look at theta one, that's the angle made by that triangle at the center of the circle of radius R1. Okay, so what we're gonna do is have a putative set of radii, one for each vertex. And that's called a label. And 
if I tell you the label, you can use it to compute in each face at each vertex what the implied angle is from that label, just using a, a hyperbolic trig formula. Then you can add them up for each vertex. And so some vertices may have a sum that's too big, exceeding 2 pi, and some may be too small. So if you have a vertex whose angle sum in, the, in your putative label exceeds 2 pi, then you can reduce it to 2 pi simply by making the radius larger. On the other hand, if the angle sum is less than 2 pi, then you can fix it up by decreasing the radius. Um, of course, when you do that, you, you affect the angles at the adjacent vertices. And there's a monotonicity lemma that tells you that when you decrease the radius for one vertex and you keep the neighbors of fixed radius, then although the angle sum at the vertex whose radius you decreased will increase, the angle sum at each of the neighbors decreases. And it's also important that the area of all the hyperbolic triangles incident on that vertex will, will decrease when you decrease the radius. Um, and that's that lemma drives everything. Um, so the nice thing about the upper Perron method, which um, I think was one of, one of the great things Phil did in that paper was that you can start with a putative label where all of the radii are infinity. Um, so when you do that, all the angle sums will be too small. And so that corresponds in the Perron method to a, a super harmonic function, and we call it a super solution. So every, every radius is bigger than it should be if its neighbor's radii were correct. And so we're going to cycle through the vertices. This is the algorithm now. And for every vertex in turn, we're going to adjust the radius given its neighbor's current radii so that its angle sum becomes exactly 2 pi. And you can prove using the monotonicity that that will always be a radius decrease. So we have this sequence of approximations of putative labels getting smaller and smaller, and they're all bounded below by zero. So they must converge. And then the question is, what do they converge to? So we would like them to converge to a label which is positive everywhere, because if that happens, then the angle sum at each of those vertices will be 2 pi. And then that's the thing we were looking for. Um, so really, this is where the, the hard work in Phil's paper is. Uh, he uses um, the Gauss-Bonnet theorem, essentially, um, and this these observations about hyperbolic areas being related to Euler characteristics, that's the Gauss-Bonnet part, um, to show that actually the limit is nowhere zero, subject to some, some conditions. So um, okay, so 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 we get a limit packing label, and now we're going to lay out the, the disks. So we know the radius of each of each disk in the hyperbolic metric. So let's start with two interior vertices, which are neighbors. And we'll just lay those out next to each other with the correct radii, wherever we like in the hyperbolic plane. And then it's like a game of dominoes. You just put down a mutual neighbor of those two. There's a unique way to put it down with the correct radius and the correct orientation. And then you just keep going. Uh, you can always find a next disk to lay out whose position is determined by what you've already laid out. And then you have to check that the, the positions you end up with don't depend on the order in which you lay the disks out. And that's a consequence of the complex being simply connected. So that's, that's called a monodromy theorem. Okay, so this talk is actually about spherical geometry and packings in spherical geometry. So let me just say something about why the, this Perron method doesn't work in spherical geometry. Uh, so the first sort of high, high level problem is that um, we, 
it's not so natural to start by trying to compute the spherical radii, because if you have a spherical packing, then the group of automorphisms, so the group of Mobius maps, uh, moves that packing around to other packings, and it doesn't act by um, by isometries or even similarities of the spherical metric. And worse, it's a non-compact group. So there's there's some six parameter family of solutions. Um, we're looking to break that symmetry somehow and to build an algorithm which doesn't go off to infinity along an orbit of this, of this group. So that's one problem. Um, the monotonicity still holds in a local sense. So uh, this is the formula that tells you the, the angle theta one subtended when I have a spherical JD6 triangle with radii R1, R2, and R3, um, you can just differentiate and, and check that as long as the sum of any two of the radii is at most pi over two, then you still have that, that monotonicity. Um, but that's not enough on its own to make the upper Perron method or the lower Perron method work. Um, so one problem is you can't start with all the radii being infinity that's not an allowed radius in spherical geometry. Um, so a disk, a disk of radius greater than pi is just the whole, uh, the whole of the sphere. So that's never going to work when you're packing it with other things. Um, so more of a problem is the positive curvature. So suppose you start with a genuine packing, a genuine spherical packing of a triangulation. And then you take all the radii and scale them down by 10%. So what happens? All the angle sums get smaller. And so we end up with what we called before a super solution. Now in, hyper, in hyperbolic geometry, a super solution was actually bigger than the solution we want. But in spherical geometry, we've now got a, something that locally is a, a super solution, and yet globally is less than the the correct label. So if we start from that label and take steps of the iterative fixing up, we're going to keep making the, the radii smaller and smaller, and that's taking us further away from the correct solution. So it simply doesn't work. Okay, well, there are other proofs of the KAT theorem and its relatives. Um, some very nice ones conceptually are the ones where you write down a functional of the radii and then show that the circle packings correspond to critical points of that functional. Um, and there's, there's a slew of these functionals in the literature. Um, they all work in hyperbolic geometry or Euclidean geometry to prove the the packing theorems there. But they don't work in spherical geometry to prove the packing theorem. So why is that? Well, um, it's a question of convexity. So the nice Euclidean functional that Babenko and Springborn wrote down is a convex function of the logs of the Euclidean radii. And if, you've, if you fix the scale, I mean, the Euclidean packing, you have a choice of scale, um, you, can, you can restrict the functional to a hyperplane to, to pin down that scale to a single scale. And then you get a strictly convex functional. Um, now Thurston's algorithm corresponds to minimizing that functional one variable at a time, which is actually a terrible numerical method for minim minimizing a convex functional. It's, um, not the way any numerical analyst would do it. Um, so a nice thing about these functionals is that, although sometimes the functions involved in, in writing down the functional are um, fairly hairy, involving things like um, logarithmic integrals, uh, the derivatives are nice and easy to evaluate, and methods for minimizing convex functions tend to involve the derivatives.
Okay, so there's a function of the spherical radii, which Boris Springborn wrote down in his thesis, uh, for which the, the packings correspond to critical points and vice versa. Uh, but it turns out the critical points are not minima. It's not a convex functional. And that makes it a bit trickier to find them computationally. Um, but you can evaluate the derivative of this functional, the grad of this functional at any point. And you can also evaluate the Hessian. And if you know the, the grad and the Hessian, then you can run Newton's method to, to solve the, the problem of making all the derivatives zero simultaneously. In other words, to find a critical point. And I've succeeded in doing this numerically. If you start close enough to a solution, then you can actually use this method. Okay, so that's a, a little tour of the difficulties of spherical packing. Um, so I'll change topic slightly now to um, discrete conformal maps. So Thurston's idea was that you can think of a complex, a, a triangulation as being like a discrete version of a conformal structure. Uh, in the sense that if you have two circle packings which pack the same complex, maybe they're both packings of a combinatorial disk into, um, into, the, into the plane, so that's what LES was doing yesterday, um, the correspondence between the, the two packings is a discrete analogue of a conformal mapping between the, the two domains. Um, and if you're working in Euclidean geometry, you can actually turn a packing into a piecewise linear function just by interpolating linearly between the, the locations of the vertices. Okay, so uh, let's think about branched circle packings now. And um, so if you just want conformal mappings, then you only want the discretizations to be univalent circle packings. But if you want analytic functions, they have branch points. And so when you discretize them, you're going to want branched circle packings. So as I said, we're going to allow a, a circle in our packing to have a chain of neighbors that goes around more than once before joining up. So here's a complex. There's a circle packing of it. Um, actually, it's the maximal packing into, into the unit disk. So the neighbors of this central circle I've shaded and now the same complex with the central circle as a branch circle. So you can see these, I think there are nine neighbors. If you carefully track starting at this top one, there's its neighbor, there's its neighbor, there's the neighbor of that one, the neighbor of that one, the neighbor, the neighbor, the neighbor, the neighbor, and then back to the start. So we went around twice. Okay. so. I want to think of a branched packing as being a collection of metric balls with disjoint interiors. So they don't look very disjoint, they're clearly overlapping. Uh, so to make them disjoint, I'm going to make them live in a branched covering surface, which is spread over the Riemann sphere. So as I went around the central circle twice, I imagine I'm going from one sheet of a Riemann surface. Once I go all the way around once, I'm on the other sheet then I go around again and I'm back on the original sheet. So it's a uh, two sheeted cover, but it's branched over, over the center of this circle. Um, so there's a metric on that covering surface, which you get by lifting, locally lifting the spherical metric to that cover. Um, so away from the branch points, it's just a nice Riemannian metric but the branch points themselves become cone points. Um, so they're, they're points where the total angle around that point is two pi if it's an, a normal point, but four pi in the example I just gave, and it could be six pi if you have three sheets and so on. So it's, it's not a Riemannian metric. And that's, that's a pity because that means we can't apply Schramm's theorem. Um, okay, so there's some things we can do. So a discrete analog of a polynomial, um, suppose we take a, a 
triangulation of the sphere, and we pick a vertex and make that be represented by um, the complement of the unit disk. And then we're going to pack everything else inside the unit disk like we did before, except now some of the vertices we're going to mark as being branch vertices. And so instead of aiming for an angle sum of two pi in this Perron method, we're going to aim for two pi times some integer kV. So every vertex has a, an integer kV, it may be one, in which case it's a, an ordinary vertex. If it's bigger than one, then it's a branch vertex. And this is the nice thing about Phil's paper, the method just works again. Uh, you start with all the, um, with the infinite label and you work your way down and you always aim for these angle sums instead of two pi. And then what happens is you have to decide whether some of the limit radii are zero. And so Phil, and I think there was another paper that gave the same criterion independently by Garrett. Um, he, he came up with a very nice necessary and sufficient condition for the limit to be positive everywhere. So it says, if you have a, an edge connected set of interior vertices, this capital V, and you count the faces, this is FV, the number of faces incident on that set, that number of faces must be at least twice the total amount of valence of the vertices in, in the set V, so the sum of these KVs. Um, so I can translate that. If I, have a, if I have a simple closed cycle of edges, then the number of edges in that cycle has to be more than twice the total amount of branching, which is strictly enclosed by that cycle. That's, the, that's what this condition means in that case. Um, so for example, if you just have one interior vertex, so this set V was a, a single vertex, if you want to wind around um, twice, then you better have at least five neighbors. If you want to wind around three times, you better have at least seven neighbors. Um, but something could go wrong. You could have a, sh a fairly short cycle of edges that encloses a large number of interior vertices and a few of them have branching and it adds up to, to too much for the, the cycle of, of circles to wind around enough times. So this is, this is all in hyperbolic geometry. Um, so again, this, this is proved by a gauss bonnet type argument and it matters really that the, the um, areas of all the faces are positive and that the curvature is negative. Okay, so let's lay out that, that um, packing, assuming that that condition is satisfied. Um, so the monodromy theorem still works. It, all that matters is that the complex is simply connected. And what you find when you've laid out all the circles is that the boundary horror disks will go several times around the unit circle. And the number of times they go around is um, I guess it should be one plus this actually, that's a mistake. So one plus the total number of, uh, the, this is like the total branching, is, is a term that appears in the riemann hurwitz formula. So the total excess valence. Um, so we can think of this thing as being like a, a discrete polynomial because now we have the original complex has a, an unbranched maximal sphere packing. That was what the KAT theorem gave. And we've got this new packing of the same complex in which some of the vertices are branch circles. And half of the total branching is now at this one circle, which is the complement of the unit disk. So that's, that's like a polynomial function, which has half of its total branching thought of as a meromorphic function on the Riemann sphere at a single point which is the point at infinity. Okay, so just to illustrate that, the same thing, I've started with a, a random triangulation of, the, of a disk, of a polygon. Um, I've chosen a vertex represented by this circle to be a branch circle. 
uh, I apply Phil's method, um, but actually using Ken's software. And the, the image of the circle that we chose to be the branch circle is just too tiny to see. Um, and that's because the derivative is zero in the, in the actual polynomial that this is mimicking. And so that tells you that the circle had to shrink a great deal. Uh, but what's interesting is what's happened to the, the horror disks. So these 11 horror disks, if you go from neighbor to neighbor, you'll find that you go around twice. And then putting that back into the Riemann sphere, this is the point at infinity is where my cursor is. So this is the, the branch disk at infinity. And then um, this is a picture of some circles on the sphere. So I've moved the unit circle to be here. Okay, so there's a, there's a general construction of many discrete rational maps, which don't have to be um, discrete polynomials. Uh, so what we're going to do is take a univalent circle packing on the Riemann sphere, and we're going to, um, to look at its geodesically embedded nerve. So that's the, the graph that we started with, uh, with its edges represented by spherical geodesics, but joining the centers of the disks. Um, we're going to fix a rational map, so a classical rational map, just a, a ratio of two complex polynomials. So that's a branched covering map from the Riemann sphere, that's C hat to itself. And we're going to specify that every critical value, so the image under R of a point where the derivative of R vanishes, or of a um, or infinity if there's a double pole. Uh, every critical value of R is a circle center in our packing. So it's one of the vertices of this nerve. Okay, so, so now we can think of the, the Riemann surface of the map R. It's a branched cover of the, of the Riemann sphere. And it's got, well, whatever the degree of R is, let's call it D, it's got D sheets and the critical values of R are the points around which the, you don't locally have just D sheets, but you have some singularity where you can go around a circle around that point, a small circle around that point, and it takes you from one sheet to another. Um, so what we're going to do is make copies. We have this, uh, we have this uh, triangulation embedded on the sphere, we're going to lift it up to every sheet of, of the covering surface. So make a copy of every vertex on every sheet above it, do the same with every edge and do the same with every face. Um, so that's okay. Uh, we're also going to lift the disks in the, in the packing. So for most of the disks, uh, we're just going to get D copies of that disk above it. But when you have a disk whose center is one of the critical values of the rational map, then some of its uh, copies ab above itself on this branched cover may be um, disks that wind around more than once before they close up. So anyway, we, we get a complex on this covering surface um, that covering surface is secretly the Riemann sphere again because we got it from this map R from C from the Riemann sphere to itself. And so that means that you could also represent that that complex that we just drew on the covering surface in a univalent way and so a different way um, just using the KAT theorem. So now we have two different circle packings, one univalent and one multivalent for the same complex. So that's an example of a discrete rational map. And it has the property that if you have, uh, so as a branch circle packing, it doesn't make very interesting pictures because if you have two disks on different sheets and their projections under this covering map, if they overlap, then they actually coincide. 
So you don't you don't see any of the interesting behavior of overlapping disks like this that we had in that last picture. Nevertheless, it's a way to make lots of discrete rational maps. And it's actually useful for something. Um, so if you want to if you want to solve the problem of finding a classical rational map with a given degree, given critical values, and given monodromy, so that's the way that the way that you permute the sheets as you walk around each of the critical values. So that's that's a strange kind of problem because you have some continuous data, the locations of the critical values, and you also have some algebraic data, which is the uh, representation of uh, the fundamental group of the sphere punctured at the critical values into the symmetric group, which tells you the uh, how you permute the sheets. And that's, that representation is called the monodromy. And in fact, uh, circle packing followed by Newton's method to make things more precise is the best way I know to solve that particular problem. Okay, so here's, here's my favorite discrete rational map, I think. Um, so we're just gonna take 12 spherical disks centered at the vertices of a regular icosahedron. And each one has this particular spherical radius, arctan of, oh, arctan of one plus the square root of five over two. Um, so this gives you a branch circle packing uh, in which uh, every vertex, and so every every disk center is a vertex of the regular icosahedron. Every disk is a simple branch disk. So its chain of neighbors is five disks that wind around it twice. And you can arrange that the critical points, so the the centers of the of the disks and the centers of the disks they map to in this branch packing are exactly the critical points and critical values of this particular rational map of degree seven. Um, and it sends, so the critical points are the vertices of the icosahedron. The critical values are also the vertices of the icosahedron and the map permutes them. And it's a permutation which sends neighboring vertices in the icosahedron to vertices which are at combinatorial distance two in the icosahedron. Uh, it's, it's very pretty. Um, and there are other similar examples for, for other platonic solids um, and for dihedral and um, cyclic groups as well, which were all found by Ken Stevenson's summer project student, Samantha Corvino. Okay, so now some enumeration. So if I have a rational map of degree D, then generically it has two D minus two critical points. And if you uh, map those under the function, then you get the critical values. So two D minus two critical values generically distinct. And if I tell you a generic choice of two D minus two points in the Riemann sphere, and say, I would like those to be the critical values of a rational function, how many rational functions are there which, which achieve that? The answer is this rather large number, um, 2d minus 2 factorial d to the d minus 3 over d factorial. So that's something that grows super exponentially with d. Um, and how do you get it? Well, Hurwitz knew that it should be the number of ways to write the identity permutation in the symmetric group SD as a product of 2d minus 2 transpositions, which generate the symmetric group. So the reason is that as you walk around each critical value, you permute the sheets by just transposing two of them, because it's just a simple critical value of the image of just one critical point. And walking around all of those critical points just once is equivalent to doing nothing. And so that's why you have to make the product of these transpositions be the identity. But also you want your covering surface to be connected 
which is why the products of the transpositions must generate the symmetric group. Um, now, the hard part is actually counting those, those ways of writing the identity as a product of such a sequence of transpositions. Um, so it was, the story of this is that it was proven by two physicists who were studying quantum chromodynamics. And they noticed that two models they were studying had to be the same model and comparing their partition functions gave this identity as a, a byproduct. And then later, Volker Strail went back and looked in Hurwitz's writings and found that he basically did have a proof of this count. Um, so he has a paper explaining how you could make Hurwitz's approach work. Um, and then this, this identity was generalized by Goulden and Jackson. Um, you can replace the, the identity being the, the the target product with any permutation. And they enumerate the, the number of ways of doing that. Um, OK, so if you have degree three, that gives you four different rational maps. And for degree four, it already gives you 120. So the, these are the rational maps that you can get exactly by the cut and paste construction. Ken calls it the, the range construction, the, the construction I talked about already. Now, the problem that I wanted to advertise is this. So suppose you're given a triangulation of the sphere and you're given a set of vertices where the branching is supposed to happen and you're told what the branch order is at each of those vertices. And suppose you satisfy this condition that the, um, the sum of kv minus one is even, so that's supposed to be 2d minus two, where d is the, the degree of the discrete rational map that we're about to make, uh, and strictly less than half of this sum comes from any one vertex. So it's not just one of those discrete polynomial examples. So the question is, what further conditions do you need to, to impose on this triangulation and the choice of branch orders to guarantee that there exists a circle packing on a branched circle packing on the sphere, which has this underlying complex and the given branching. Uh, and the second question is, if it does exist, how can you compute it? And maybe the answer to those will be the same answer. Uh, because if you gave an algorithm, then you would get existence. Um, so this is the discrete analog of a slightly different problem than, than the one we just talked about. So if you specify 2D minus two points in the Riemann sphere and ask, are those the critical points of some rational map of degree D? And if so, how many rational maps? Um, it's that problem. And so what's the classical answer? Uh, the answer is the Catalan number of rational maps. So for degree D, if I give you a generic choice of 2D minus two points in the Riemann sphere, then the number of rational maps having those 2d minus two points as, as their critical points is this Catalan number. Um, as long as I say that two rational maps, which are, well, one is given by composing the other one with a Mobius map, which doesn't change the critical points. As, as, I have to say those are equivalent. So I'm counting a, equivalence classes of, of maps. Um, now, this sequence only grows exponentially, so it grows slower than the previous sequence. Um, a nice fact is if, if those 2d minus 2 points are all in the real line, then, in fact, every one of these equivalence classes has a representative, which is a rational map with real coefficients. And that's a very non-obvious fact. Um, but given that fact, now you can see where the Catalan numbers come from. So if you have a rational map with real coefficients and you just draw the locus of points where it takes real values, well, you have the whole real line and then you have some arcs in the upper and lower half planes, so symmetric arcs, which join together pairs of the critical points. So the critical points are just 2d minus two points along the real line and you, if you 
know your Catalan number as well, you'll know that they count the number of non-crossing matchings uh, of, of uh, 2d minus two points by arcs in the upper half plane that don't cross each other. Okay, so we could refine the problem. If we have a triangulation of the two sphere with 2d minus two distinct vertices marked as being simple branch points, um, can we prove that the number of branch circle packings having that complex and that branching is at most this number CD um, up to equivalence by post composition with Mobius maps? And secondly, can we show that for every degree, there is some triangulation of the sphere and some choice of 2D minus two marked vertices for which this number of distinct branch circle packing, so in, in equivalent branch circle packings exists. So it's an open problem as far as I know. Um, it seems quite plausible because you can take a, you can take a very fine mesh triangulation and you can uh, use the actual classical rational functions, which, it, which have these critical points as your guide for um, what the spherical radii should be in the branch packing. You just take take the spherical radius of the of the circle in the univalent packing and multiply it by the derivative of the classical map. And that, that gives you a guess for what the spherical radius should be in the branch packing. Maybe there are cases where that gets you close enough that you can then correct it to a genuine packing using Newton's method. Okay, so at least I can show for degree three that uh, there exists there exist examples with two inequivalent uh, discrete rational maps with the same complex and the same branching data. Um, I'm going to skip quickly through this because I want to get to the end. I know it looks like I have a lot of slides left, but there's an animation coming. Um, so you can take your favorite triangulation of the sphere. Uh, pick a couple of uh, vertices v1 and v2 with degree at least five and another one w with degree at least seven and then there's a couple of things that you can do to build from that a spherical a new spherical triangulation um, so we get what we're going to do is uh, reflect this complex in the circle representing w and then fix the complex up. It, at that point, it's going to have some uh, degree four faces. We're just going to insert an extra vertex in the middle of each of those faces. Um, so here's the picture. Where I'm moving my cursor now is the original complex. I've reflected it in a circle here. So that around the back of the Riemann sphere is a, a reflected copy of the original complex. And then I've inserted these ball bearing circles of degree four here, 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 and so on. And I claim that you can make two different, uh, so with this triangulation as the, the nerve of this is the triangulation, you can make two different cubic discrete rational maps. Um, I'm just gonna skip through how that works. Um, there's one of them you can see where the ball bearing circles have gone. They're on the equator here. Uh, here's the other one. This time the ball bearing circles are still on the equator, but all the action is happening up at the top. So that's the, the North Pole. And this one and this one, I think, are the branch circles. Okay, so um, what does the fact that the discrete rational maps are not unique, say, about how you might prove their existence. Well, one thing is it, it shows you can't prove it by minimizing a globally convex functional, because then you would only get one solution. Um, and it also means that if you have an iterative algorithm, you're gonna face the problem that you get when you try to find the roots of a polynomial with Newton's method which is that there are going to be some bad starting points where you, you get 
you can't decide which of the two basins of attraction you're going to land in. Um, so what we want to do is show the existence of critical points and maybe even count the critical points. And there is a tool for doing that. If we take something like Boris Springborn's spherical functional, we could try to apply Morse theory to it. Um, so first you apply some normalization by fixing some of the radii so that you don't have the Mobius ambiguity. But you would need to understand, which, which I don't, um, how the index of the critical points of this functional is related to the, the geometry or the topology or maybe just the, de the degree of the corresponding discrete rational map. It's not clear to me that they all have the same index. Um, and you would also have to understand the topology of the very high and very low level sets of this functional. And then maybe Morse theory would count the critical points for you. Um, that's only gonna work if, if there's no cancellation between the uh, indices. Okay, what, what I prefer is to try to attack this problem with Schramm's theorem. Um, so what I would like to do is take a Riemannian metric, um, which is obtained by what's called mollifying the um, path metric that I talked about earlier. So just in the neighborhood of, of each of those cone points, you convolve the Riemannian metric uh, with a smooth bump function. And that gives you a smooth Riemannian metric. Now you can apply Schramm's theorem and then you can try to take a limit in which those mollifications have smaller and smaller support. And then the question is, what happens in that limit? Um, so it could be that you get a nice limiting packing, which is a metric packing of the singular metric. And if you do, then it's going to be not just the branching I talked about where some disks have a chain of neighbors that wind around more than once, uh, but possibly something more complicated called generalized branching. Okay, so the generalized branching is something that you can uh, parameterize. So we found this is the joint work with James Ash and Ken Stevenson. We found a uh, set of techniques for persuading circle packing software to produce packings that have this special kind of branching. So one thing that can happen is that several disks meet at one of the singular points, so more than two disks, and we call that a singular branching. And another thing that can happen is that you have a disk which is not centered at one of the singular points, but its radius is bigger than the distance to the nearest singular point. So if you follow around the, the boundary of that disk, it will switch from one sheet to another. And when it's on one sheet, it's gonna go in a circle centered on the singular point. And on the other sheet, it will go in a circle centered on the center of the disk. Um, and we found you could trick circle pack into computing these packings uh, by modifying the complex, the underlying complex in a certain way. Um, and when you do that, you have to introduce some continuous parameters. Um, for example, when you have three disks meeting at a singular point, there's some freedom, some wiggle room, because you have a total angle four pi there. And the disks only occupy three pi of that. Um, so you, you have to specify how, how they're separated, by what angles they're separated. So you have two parameters. And it's also true in the shifted case that you have two continuous parameters. So here's a little movie of the shifted case. So I have in the middle this shaded, what looks like two shaded circles. That is actually one disk in this path metric on a covering surface. You can see where it's branched. The branch point is the center of the smaller gray disk. And the center of the ball, of the metric ball, is the center of the bigger gray disk. And let's change the parameters and see what happens. So now, now I think as I move it, you can see 
you can see which disk is on which sheet more easily. Maybe you can convince yourself about the, the way that you transfer from one sheet to another as you go around. Okay, so, so the idea to attack the, the problem is we're going to take a limit of these SRAM packings um, in which the mollification is getting is shrinking down to the to each of the singular points and we have to understand whether in that limit some of the disks in the SRAM packing could shrink to having zero radius just like what could happen if you had an obstruction in uh, in Phil's paper um, but the problem a problem you now have is that uh, you're in positive curvature so it's harder to write down uh, necessary and sufficient conditions and we haven't managed to do that. Um, finally, if you can do that, you have a chance that you could apply the invariance of domain theorem. So this is what Phil was talking about in his talk, a uh, similar idea. We have a, a way of parameterizing some packings using these overlap angles and the, the parameterization of the shifted branch points. And because we had 2d minus two branch points and there's two parameters for each one, we have a 4d minus four dimensional space of, of parameters, uh, parameter choices. Um, and we have a cho some choice about the initial normalization. Um, and it turns out that when you count the number of degrees of freedom that you have in choosing the critical so we, we got to choose the critical values to make the surface. Um, and the parameter counts agree. So there's a chance that you could use the invariance of domain theorem, proving that the generalized packings depend continuously on the parameters and some properness um, in order to show that there's a homeomorphism between these two ways of parameterizing these types of packing. Um, that's strictly a dream. I, I don't know how to do it, but perhaps someone here who really tries hard could do it. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. Um, also, my last Thank you. Slide. The next slide was supposed to say questions, but it doesn't seem to be there. Yeah, questions, yes. Did you say dream or nightmare? A it's a dream. <laughs> it may not be harder than the, the conjecture that Phil was talking about. Yes, David, hi. Hi, um, really enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little more about uh, what you mean by convergence of the SRAM packings, because you have sort of a lot going on. The, you have the mollified metrics and you have the circles. So I don't know if there's yeah. a- Yeah, okay. Um, so the, the one thing that's fixed is the, the locations of the branch points, the branch values and the surface that everything lives on. So you, you can make sense of the convergence of the circle centers and you can make sense of the convergence of this of the radii so that's that's the sense in which in which the packings could converge so the metric is changing but the you have a over the whole sequence you have a uniform way of saying where the centers are and what the radii are and so you fix some sort of metric on that on that uh, the that location. Yeah. So it, if you're away from any one of if you're not at one of the branch points, then that sequence of metrics is locally eventually constant. I see. Thanks, Elias. Um, uh, did you think about uh, modeling branch points in a different way? Uh, one problem is that uh, always when you have a branch points, uh, 
point um, you have to um, change the complex. If this has a high degree, you have to have uh, a sufficient number of neighbors. Uh, is there a way to model a branch point by several disks, which are somehow located? And uh, this chain of neighbors uh, wraps around one disk and then the other one. Do you see what I mean? I, I understand this, what you mean. It just came to my mind. <laughs> I think we have thought about that before. And perhaps I've even talked with you about that before. Um, I don't think so. I, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I've forgotten it. But <laughs> I've, I've certainly been asked the question before. It's, it's attempting, yeah, it's, maybe it's a natural thing to do. Um, I actually prefer just to allow packings in which some vertices end up having disks of radius zero representing them. Okay. I, I would prefer to say we just accept that sometimes parts of the complex are going to get sucked into one of these singularities. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, and uh, this also is close if uh, you have a, a disk with, with radio zero, then the neighboring disks are touching. Then this comes close to my philosophy that it's better not to use the centers by the contact points. Right. And ah, maybe this is yes. So in our right. in our circle pack software, we do it by um, deliberately introducing some vertices which we know in advance will be represented by disks of radius zero, but they still okay. have they still have a relationship with their neighbors. Their neighbors are still cyclically ordered around them. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So that, I think they they are quite similar to the dots that you talked about. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, I wonder <laughs> uh, in the rigidity theory world, if uh, branching has uh, a natural place there. So in um, in bar and joint mechanisms, for example, is 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 there some notion of branching that's uh, analogous to the uh, classical notion in analytic function theory? And um, so someone might address that at some point if if the question makes sense. 